Today on the Topping Show, Bud Light Eagles tweet has a little bit of a broken wing. Vivek American Dream goes viral. Chicago mayor wants the government to run grocery stores. DeSantis uses a clip of the Daily Wire of Trump appearing to hesitate when asked, can a man be a woman? Is it disinformation? You decide. Disney to invest $60 billion in theme parks and cruises. Twitter X might charge for users, all of them. Crayola, yes, the crayon company, is now attempting to sell flowers. Instacart has their IPO launched. Target to hire 100,000 holiday workers. And Clorox suffered a cybersecurity attack, which may lead to a little bit of a kneecap in the supply chain. All that and much more on The Topping Show. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to tune in today. Today's episode of Topping Show is sponsored by Topping Technologies. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see their founders twice a day. Gotta say he's quite handsome and brilliant. He's me. That's a joke. If you're an IT leader or business owner and need a little assistance, reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Also, we're giving away a free flamethrower with every September purchase. Go to toppingtechnologies.com to learn a little bit more. And yes, you can mount it to an AR-15 as all awesome accessory can be. Lastly, trying to get to 4,000 subscribers by the end of September. So if you can click that button, we'd greatly appreciate it. Now going over to the business part of the podcast, you have X Twitter. Well, they might just charge everyone for using the platform. Now, Elon's had these issues for probably about a year now where there's two issues really. One, the platform still not making a profit. Two, well, it looks like there is still a myriad of bots like armies upon armies upon armies of bots. Now, it looks like there's apparently 550 million actively monthly users of the platform. And even more astonishingly, it looks like they generate up to 200 million posts per day, which sounds crazy, but at the same time, I tend to believe given how most people who use Twitter are very similar to alcohol sales. It seems like you have an 80-20% principle where 20% 20% of the people will consume 80% of the product. And I can't help but think on Twitter, maybe it's even a smaller percentage of people, but the people who tweet, they tweet. I mean, you look at someone like Jordan Peterson, who I respect on a philosophical level, he tweets like a Twitter addict. That seems to be a big hobby of his. We're talk- talking about one person sending thousands upon thousands and thousands of tweets. And now, now that I think about it, I have to look him up. He sent out 44.5 thousand tweets. One man. That I mean, that's literally tweets upon tweets a day. And I would argue most of these things on Twitter are a time sink, although except with awesome content you could find at N-I-C-T-O-P-P-I-N-G or at The Topping Show, both awesome Twitter handles, of course. But it's one of those issues where the bots are still there. Elon thought he could buy the company, he could purge them using magic and technology, which, so depending on how you describe it to people, it's almost one of the same these days. But it's one of those instances where bots, they cost about a fraction of a dollar. Apparently, there are some people that could buy them for a couple of cents a piece. And because you can just easily automate the task, you can have old armies of bots. Because it's not cost prohibitive. Now, Elon's thought, and again, it's a very fluid situation. One of the things that's interesting about X and Twitter is... Unlike a traditional business where you have, you know, quarterly updates and they'll tell the public about certain things that are happening and it's very structured, he's much more off the cuff, as some might say. So he's thinking about this and for all we know, he's going to pass this rule tomorrow or maybe he'll walk it back. But his idea right now is that we're going to have everyone pay something. So right now, if you're a fancy and accomplished person like me, You can afford $8 a month, not humble brag right there, to pay for Twitter Blue. And in theory, you do see less ads and people are supposed to see your tweets more. I don't know about the latter, but there are certainly a little bit less ads when I'm going between my business profile and my personal profile. And that is certainly a value add. However, the issue was when Elon came out with the Twitter Blue idea, which interestingly enough, every other social media company mocked him for that. They said it would never work. And of course, then they copied him because now you could pay for a premium, I think Snapchat as well as Facebook and Instagram where we have similar features. You get the fancy little blue authorization check that makes you look official. And you also, in theory, get less ads and more people to see your actual tweets and your post. So that's pretty revolutionary. However, I don't think enough people signed up for it to maintain profitability. Now, the issue is these two groups of people have very different things. You have the ad agencies and you have the people. 
Traditionally, most of the people, well, I should specify, people who value American, people actually believe in American values. I know, unfortunately, there's far, few, far, far too few of us these days, but those people want more free speech. They believe everyone should have the ability to tweet, whether you're Alex Jones or Obama. They want everyone to have equality. Now, Alex Jones, I think, is the perfect litmus test. If you don't believe he deserves free speech, I wouldn't consider you to be an American. Well, I don't agree with many of the things he says, although it is concerning when more of the conspiracy theories turn out to be true. It's one of those instances where people who truly believe in free speech, they're all of the mindset of, I may not agree with what you're saying, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. To me, that's the embodiment of American values. And I believe everyone should have that thought because, again, everyone has the ability and should have the freedom for free speech. Unfortunately, advertisers, they don't like that. They especially like to discriminate against people in the middle and more politically on the right side of the political aisle. So that means the advertisers, again, Elon had the Twitter blue, they're still losing money. He, he said they're close to breaking even, but he has investors, it's not just him that bought the company. So you also have these third parties, um, you know, you have a couple of financial institutions, they chipped into money, they wanna make some cash on it. So now he has to appease the advertisers, which inherently means this will be great. there'll be ever increasing censorship. And we've seen this more and more. Now. His idea is maybe it'll be one or two bucks. And this will help them not just make money, but it'll decrease the bots. Because after a certain price point, it's not economical to have an army of bots. Presumably, it's a profitable venture now because it costs you know just a few pennies, apparently. But even if it costs a couple of dollars, in the aggregate, if you were getting armies of these bots, well, the three letter acronyms at the government might just have to swipe the credit card one too many times. They might not want to do that, maybe. In, in terms of people who are probably buying armies of you know, bots on the Twitter, but it's one of those things where the downside is the audience is going to shrink. If he does this rule, there's going to be a lot of attrition. A lot of people are not going to want to pay for it. It's one of those fantastically fascinating things where everyone will do something for free. A lot of people will participate in activity or they'll go use their social media or product if it's free. As soon as it costs something, even if it's just a dollar, it's going to be too much of a burden for them. For some people, it takes that's just a little modicum of effort to enter that credit card in. It's too much. They just won't do it. That's why when you go to the app store on the iPhone and the Android based phones, you go to the apps, they're all free. Well, not really. You pay for them with your data, but most of them are free. As soon as it goes to just even just 99 cents, less people will adopt that technology because it's a barrier to entry, albeit a relatively small fiscal one. It's introducing friction into the experience of signing on and adopting that new platform and this new app. So let me know in the comments, do you, what do you think the percentage would be if he goes to this idea? The percentage of decrease would be 5%, 10%, 20%. maybe 20%. It's definitely not going to be zero. And then the other, the upside would be the good part would be there'd be a lot less bots. So how much will this decrease on the number of bots on the platform? That would be great. Now, that's another hard t question to ask is how many bots are there really? There's a lot of uncertainty. No one really knows. Another pretty big issue. So I think it's a good idea because it will get rid of the, it will definitely get rid of the bots and it would get rid of a lot of the unsavory activity on Twitter. Because it would be less, it'd be less inherently less profitable for them, but it would shrink the audience. Now, we have reached a pivotal point in social media where it used to be back in the day when basically the, the banks can give cash away for free, you know, 0% interest rates. This is one of those things where the, the success of an app or social media company was strictly basically measured by number of users. Active users is all they cared about. They really, which is why the previous owners of Twitter, there wasn't really much of an incentive to crack down on the bots because it made the company look bigger on paper. So the incentive structure wasn't quite right. Now, these companies, you know, it's a tight economy, 40 year inflation, cash is no longer free. So a lot of these companies, a lot of the investors are starting to wonder, well, great, you have a lot of users. How many users or how many transactions is it gonna take to make it profitable? That's a real hard question that they're starting to ask. So let me know in the comments, do you think they'll, how many, how many percentage points will it drop? 10, 20%? Let me know, but I can't help but think it'd be, it's gonna be significant. It's gonna be double, double digits will drop from using the platform, I believe. Other interesting business use, you have Crayola, the crayon company, now going to sell flowers, apparently. 
Now, Crayola, they've been around for quite some time. They were actually launched in 1903, so quite a, quite, quite a few years ago. Now, granted, nowadays it's a subsidiary of Hallmark Cards, which they have cards for damn near every occasion. And recently it said they're going to launch a new thing called Crayola Flowers, oddly enough. Now, it looks like it'll be an online flower shop selling bouquets and boxed flowers. Interesting. Now, it's also going to have another value add. It'll double as a fundraising platform. And they claim that 10 to 50% of every direct sale will be donated to a participating charity or an entity that you choose by the customer. And they also noted that nonprofits can use the storefront as well as part of their fundraising campaigns. So kind of an interesting idea. They've also partnered with someone by the name of Miss Blooms, which is an importer and distributor of fresh cut flowers, daisies, mums, hydrangeas. Obviously, you know how many times I, uh, you know how often I can, I buy flowers when I can't pronounce hardly any of them. But they claim that the prices will go all the way up to $150. Jeez Louise. And they'll also ship directly from farms to consumers nationwide. Wow. So it's kind of an interesting to go from crayons, and of course they do have the cards, and now they're going to have flowers, which it's a very prof it's a pretty pro profitable business. I mean, anything, anytime when you have emotion involved, Americans, they tend to overspend. That's why Kevin O'Leary, one of the Shark Tank champions, he frequently invests companies that have products and services around the births, the deaths, and the marriages of people. Because typically speaking, that's when the emotions are the highest and they don't care about the cost as much. As morally questionable that might be from an investor standpoint, it's true people spend more for those occasions. Now, in terms of flowers, they're pretty good. They, in terms of an investment, it's one of the things where you do it for your girlfriend you, or your wife because you love them, and it's to show of your affection. But in terms of an investment, it's good for the flower owner because that flower is going to last what? Seven, ten days maybe? And then it dies. And then you have to buy another one and another one and another one. So it's great for the flower selling company. Mm, not so great for the men who had to purchase it, the, you know, the consumer. But the value and the people, the idea is there. So it'll be interesting. Will they start to cross sell? That I think would be a more prudent business idea where they could actually incorporate. Well, again, I don't know anyone who wants flowers who would want a box of crayons, but nevertheless, it does make me reminisce. You know, not to say about tough times, but back in my day, you know, I did have a box of crayons. You maybe a single row. I think there was like ten crayons in that, maybe twelve. If you're really cool, you get the you know, it was like twice wide, kind of the size of a deck of cards. But there's always one kid in the classroom, the OG, the cool kid in the block, as they say, or as we would call it, the bee's knees. They had the crayon, the crayola box with a sharpener built into the back. That that was the pinnacle of technology and cool back in the day. We didn't need iPhones back in the day. We just had a bo cardboard box of wax crayons and a sharpener built in. That, that impressed us back in the day, as rudimentary as that might sound. But nevertheless, I think it'd be a good cross-selling experience if they could actually incorporate the Hallmark cards with the flowers, which of course would increase profitability overall. Now, it's also not ideal to introduce the idea of working with charities there's a lot of benefits to that. Also, people many people want to do good, so there's a lot of, there's a mutually beneficial agreement that can be put into that whole thing. And it'll be interesting, can't help but think, unfortunately, these days the charities, probably the ones that are politically inclined, or you could kind of guess which ones will be banned, unfortunately. But it'll be interesting to see how inclusive they truly are with those initiatives. And if it'll become a profitable venture, it, while it might sound unusual, I think it will be a good idea for the company but as I always say, time shall tell. Other interesting business news, you have Instacart IPO launching on the NASDAQ. Now, crazy enough, Instacart is actually the first notable venture-backed tech company to the U.S. public market since December 2021. That's how long we've gone without a big tech IPO, which anecdotally speaking, from my experience owning a tech company, it, it, it sounds about right. Most of the co tech companies that we work with Many of those companies, like Mimecast, Proofpoint, a lot of those cybersecurity companies, they've actually gone private the past couple of years. Partially because there's different pressures when you're a private company as opposed to a publicly traded company. Publicly traded company, especially you gotta be concerned about your fiscal quarter sales. I mean, that is one of the biggest, most important things that you need to hit 
because of course if you miss it investors get scared they sell stock goes down expectations are not met there are a whole other different pros and cons going private as well but many see it as a way to be more agile and have more freedom to make larger impact decisions that would be more frowned upon if you're publicly traded where you have to worry about quarterly results as opposed to some might argue privately company you could really focus on the long term and it's okay if you lose money maybe one or two quarters because again you have that long-term vision again a debate for another time in terms of which one's more effective but interesting enough i could Instacart's the first one in years. Now, it looks like the grocery delivery app company was once valued at $39 billion. Well, unfortunately, it's been quite diluted, so now it's worth about $14 billion, and their shares did, it looks like they went up about 40% on the NASDAQ to now hitting about $42 per share. In terms of marketing, they get A+, plus in terms of their stock ticker trader name, it's C-A-R-T, CART, which A+, plus for marketing, that just makes sense. As crazy as it sounds, one of the most unusual things when it comes to publicly traded companies, some of the names seemingly have nothing to do with the actual business. Like you look up the company name and the stock price little ticker symbol, it will be seemingly random or nothing to do with the company in and of itself. Which of course makes it hard to actually track the company unless you already know what they're doing, what they are. So a very unusual situation, but in this case, they get an A plus, makes sense. Other interesting business use, you have Target to hire 100,000 workers for the holiday season. Perhaps they're just foolishly overly optimistic, some might say. Now, Target recently has been the subject of many boycott conversations and as well as decreasing sales boycotts. They, I'm trying to think of a nice way of saying imprudently, well, they hired a Satanist designer. And I don't mean to be bombastic or over exaggerating. This person is a self proclaimed Satanist from the UK. Not that all people from the UK are, are you know, Satanists, just to clarify, of course. But this person actually is, has horns on their head and they want to do an agreement with Target for some apparel and swag for Pride Month. Interesting. And this person came out with many apparel, including a pin. And it was a fancy pin, don't get me wrong. It was enamel. We're not talking a cheap paper one where it's a paper image, they stamp it out, put it on a metal circular one. This was an enamel pin, it was fancy. And this pin was a picture of Satan. And it said, the text on the pin said, Satan respects pronouns. So that was part of their Pride Month collection. In addition to having a trans swimsuit, which was a swimsuit that was designed to look like a woman's swimsuit, but they added, and cover your ears if you have children listening, they added extra material at the bottom so that a man could tuck their junk, so to say. A interesting decision to say the least. And they also had pride materials on children's clothing. There was more controversy this year than all the other years combined. So that's why there was a boycott. Now, when this first hit the newsstands, interestingly enough, Target actually backed off a little bit, which being a very more left-wing company, I was actually surprised. They decided to move the display units to the back of the store. However, thus in doing so, they pissed off the left, oh, well, as this has become a political issue, the left side of the political aisle. And also the LGBT community, because again, they're putting it to the back of the store. That's not a good look for that, for that group of people. And they didn't appreciate that fact. So they started to boycott the company as well. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not on the precipice of being as bad as a business blunder as Bud Light. He's lost again, over $400 million in sales, but target sales were so bad. They had a six year low. That's not good. I believe that was their fiscal quarter two. It's a couple months ago. And in terms of hiring for the holiday season, Traditionally, in most businesses, Q4 is a huge deal. I mean, fiscally speaking, that's when they get in the black, so to say. That's you know, cliche to say it, but that's where the term Black Friday comes from. Traditionally, if you're in the red, that means your business is losing money. If you're in the black, you're actually having a profit. A rare thing these days, well, especially for governments, as a, as a burn, because the U.S. is now $33 trillion in debt somehow. Now, nevertheless, multiple third parties are saying this fourth quarter is not going to be great. Now, MasterCard actually had a report where they said that you expect U.S. retail sales to rise about 3.7% for the period beginning November through December 24th. So they think this year it's going to go up by about 3.7%. Last year, it went up by 7.6%. That's not good. And target sales are already decreasing. They've done a couple of things to try to ramp up sales. They had a starter, uh, well, they actually started a partnership with Starbucks to further their Starbucks offering. 
You can now order Starbucks from the Target app, which is good. It actually boosts the app Target's e-commerce sales, which is another metric for publicly traded companies. Everyone wants to be a tech company, and that makes them look good, more profitable. There's many good reasons for that, as well as the convenience for the consumer. Now, last week, they actually also announced a partnership with Kendra Scott, who is a very popular designer headquartered in Austin, Texas. And they're going to have exclusive materials or exclusive jewelry from their collection. So that's good. That means if you want that little knickknack from Kendra Scott, you have to go to Target to get it. That's, that's some business brilliance because it gives you that exclusivity. You have to go to a Target to get there. But I don't think a couple of those actions are enough to warrant hiring the same number of employees or temporary employees, albeit, than you did the same time period last year. I feel like they're being very overly optimistic in this regard because, again, 40-year hyperinflation, un economic uncertainty. I don't think people are going to buy as much as they used to this year. But let me in the comments. Do you, have you seen anecdotal, just anecdotal experience? I've heard a lot of my friends, and I know people who are participating in the boycott for both left and right reasons. Do you know anyone who's really boycotting? It's not. It doesn't seem to be that large on social media. But again, confirmation bias is a thing. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Now, going over to the culture part of the podcast, you have Bud Light, Fly Eagle, the video, but the the eagle, it, the, the wing is kind of broken, so it crashes precipitously. Now, this is, again, Bud Light attempting to tweet and crawl back, or crawl out of the grave that it dug itself with Bud Light Business Blunder of the Century with, again, hiring a um, brand ambassador whose average audience member is 15 years old. Not a very prudent business decision. Now, the tweet from Bud Light says, Fly Bud, Light fly. Fly, blood light fly. And I do have a picture of an eagle in terms of the emoji. So perhaps someone in the marketing department has more than eight brain cells. Maybe, because the emoji is kind of clever. I'll give them that. But they were pretty lazy. They actually did a partnership with the Philadelphia Eagles. So it looks like they retweeted their video. Now, the jokes write themselves. I can't help but think the average audience member of the Philadelphia Eagles they probably don't appreciate this partnership with Bud Light. And again, I don't think it makes their brand look good considering all the controversy. And the Philadelphia Eagles, they say, or rather they ask, best way to kick off your home opener with Bud Light? No, it is definitely not, if they're asking me. But nevertheless, they say, by flying through the city of brotherly love. Brotherly love, Bud Light. Oh, come on. Are they just trying to have the jokes write themselves these days? Nevertheless, they continue to say, make game days, quote, easy like Sunday, unquote, and toast to a season of owning every kickoff, every tailgate, and every moment with Bud Light, unquote. Then they hashtag easy to Sunday, fly, eagle, fly, hashtag Bud Light. And then they have this short one minute and 20 attempt at a commercial, which I will play now. Now, if you know any good softwares, and again, I'm constantly evaluating new tech, I'm literally looking for a good picture in picture production software so you can incorporate this in real time if you have any suggestions please leave them in the comments and we'll make the show better together i appreciate your input and without too much further ado i will play a video so bud light eagle or i guess it's the philadelphia eagle putting a Bud Light into a Bud Light drone, and it's got the Graffiti Eagle on the can. So it's a limited edition can, ooh. <laughs> Looks like someone pretending to be Sylvester Stallone as Rocky. Thanks for the delivery. Imagine how terrible he would have performed in real life. And instead of actually drinking like egg whites or egg yolks, he drank Bud Light. Flying all over the city, terrorizing all the citizens. A screenless kite! A Bud Light! What a delight! 
Benjamin Franklin, well, obviously he's not the real one, but someone pretending to be Benjamin Franklin being delighted by seeing a Bud Light and picking it up and then allegedly drinking it. They don't show that on screen. That's kind of just industry standard. But Benjamin Franklin, who again was a patriot, I don't think he would drink a Belgian-based beer company. Probably not. No, he would probably just pour it out. Which many would argue is the most appropriate spot, geographically speaking, for Bud Light is on the floor. Although, the plants would presumably die. So now you have a drink between Benjamin Franklin and Rocky, which is probably as accurate as the things they teach at public schools these days in the United States, unfortunately. Easy to enjoy. Now, it would have been so much better if they had that historical founding father who said, I cannot tell a lie, and if he were the one to pretend to drink a Bud Light, and then he would say, I enjoy it, or it's easy to drink. Because he, he he can't tell a lie, you see, cause, so he couldn't say that. He would just kind of stutter. Like, it's easy. It, it's easy. Like, that was a joke right there. But nevertheless, it looks like the comments are equally as mediocre as the video in itself. So it looks like, and again, we'll do some real-life fact-checking today because there appear, and we're, I'm going to be very careful with how I word this, there appear to be real positive comments. That sounds too good to be true. Let's dive in. Some by the name of James Russell says, Beer 30. Although he got zero likes at 534 views. And Bud Light responded to that saying, Best time of the day. Are they encouraging alcoholism, I suppose? Now we look at James' profile, Mr. James Russell. He has 30 followers. He appears to be ah, a proud Democrat. He says, quote, I'm a Democrat who will vote third party if Joe Biden gets the nomination again. Time to change. Vote Robert Kennedy Jr. 2024. Hashtag Kennedy 24. Now, hilariously enough, because you're a Democrat, that'll never happen. Because Democrats believe in superdelegates, which is a great way to ignore what the public actually wants. So there's a 0% chance that Robert F. Kennedy gets nominated. It's not going to happen. It's not that I don't believe that. I think he has some exceptional ideals that I appreciate. But no, the system will not let him. Very similar to the, how the Democrats blocked out Bernie Sanders when Bernie Sanders had the votes. They just blocked him. Breaking the game is something they seem to specialize in. Although I shall not elaborate from there. But yeah, so James is a proud Democrat. Repost, reposting for Domino's Pizza. CBS Sports. Football. Wow, he got one like on this one. He said, you notice Republicans are easily manipulated and easily controlled. They can't resist responding when they're upset. A little bit of the, what is it? The pot calling the kettle black, perhaps? He did get one like, though. Now, not to brag, but last week I did it. I got two likes on my tweet. At N-I-C-T-O-P-P-I-N-G. Or at the topping show. Dealer's choice. Now, this person appears to be real. A rarity in and of itself. You have a real person responding to Bud Light with a positive statement. Let's investigate the second. Yeah, there's two. No, no, there's three of the thousands of responses. <laughs> One meme just says, go to hell. So that's definitely not positive. Of all the responses, there's three real ones. The second one is from Momers. This person says, go birds. And Bud Light says, birds, Bud Lights, with a handshake emoji, which doesn't even sound like proper, proper English from a response perspective. Eh, perhaps the person just went to public school in their marketing department at Bud Light. Well, the, the, Alyssa, Alyssa Heidershaw surely went to, we know she went to a prestigious college because that's what she learned. Now it looks like Mr. Momers has 130 hours, looks to be from Massachusetts. Looks like reposting, reposting. All right, it looks like he is a fan of the sports balls. Uh, well, 
more baseball. So he appears, appears to be a real person. I'll be damned. Interesting. So he appears to be a real person in a positive response. Although he's saying go birds, so he's clearly supporting the Philadelphia Eagles. But nevertheless, a positive response on Bud Light's timeline, or rather to Bud Light's tweet. We should take a moment of silence to remember this rare occasion. It may never happen again, I suspect. You guys have somebody by the name of Greg Berber, and that person, by the way, got one like. Mr. Greg Berber has a gif, or a gif, as the youth might say, and it just says, it's a Philly thing, and a picture of the eagle. How original. The person got one like out of 476 views. Wow. And Bud Light says, Responded saying, easy to drink to Philly. Which, have they won a Super Bowl since Mark Wahlberg was their quarterback? When's the last time they were good? Is it really easy to drink? I don't know about that. Now, interestingly enough, the rest of them are, of course, negative. And interestingly enough, the top one is our reliable source, Mr. Rich Mooney. He is the one who does the fun polls to say, what will you buy today in terms of a beer preference? Now, Rich Mooney says, quote, Bud Light is sponsoring an all-ages drag show along with the Blasphemous Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence as part of their sponsorship of the Phoenix Pride Parade next month. Does this impact your choice of beer? And you have the two choices, the first one being make mine in Bud Light, and no, do not make mine in Bud Light, or more accurately, an Anheuser and Bad product. And the results are in at 88 votes. 87.5% of people said no, Anheuser Bush in Bad product for me. Which, interestingly enough, that means 12.5% of the people who voted said they would want a Bud Light because they're sponsoring a child drag show. Or, I should clarify, a child, quote, quote, child-friendly drag show. I have to say, quote, unquote, because there's no such thing as a child-friendly drag show, just like there's no such thing as a child-friendly strip club. It's not a thing. And it's quite concerning they're making it up. Now, someone actually responded Mr. Aiden Updates Fanboy, interesting, and he says, every Republican supports Bud Light, quote unquote. Now he has no love, I mean, when I mean that, he has no likes out of 608 views. Now, interestingly enough, and actually Bush InBev does have lobbyists, who can, and they actually raise money for the, at least some GOP donors or GOP candidates. So they support them, but I don't know about the inverse. In terms of the politics of who's doing the boycott, most people I know who are boycotting are on the middle or right of the political spectrum. So, not sure about that. And then he re Rich Moody actually responded to that gentleman saying, you know, quote, Bud Light is sponsoring all ages drag show along with the Blasphemous Sisters of Perpetual, Perpetual Indulgence as part of the sponsorship of the National Pride Parade next month in Phoenix. I guess they're doubling down, hashtag no Bud Light. And in that, he actually has screenshots of the website where it shows Bud Light being the premier, the premier sponsor, which when it comes to events, activities, you usually have different levels of sponsorships. Traditionally, like in technology for an IT event, you'll have like a platinum sponsor, a gold sponsor, and a silver sponsor, and maybe a bronze sponsor. So, and of course, the more precious the metal, the more money that a company spends, and the more the logo is displayed, and it's usually larger at the top. So it looks like Bud Light is going all in. And They've been supporting LGBT events for about 40 or 30 years now. So that, to me, that's not the controversy. I think more people are concerned about the targeting to kids as well as the, the new trans debate or the cultural conversation that's come across the United States. And I think that's more the fuse of why there's a boycott. You also have people who are LGBT who are boycotting it because specifically Bud Light did not stick with Dylan Mulvaney as they would say, specifically a couple holding companies in Chicago, they actually proudly said they will not have any Anheuser Bush Inbev products at the bars they own because they quote unquote did not stick with Dylan. So many people are boy participating in this boycott, and I don't see it turn around anytime soon. And as I'm scrolling through the other comments, I'm not seeing any positive. Yeah, somebody by the name of Ralph Hughes saying, Did you apologize yet? And he actually has a picture from the DailyMail.com, an article that shows LGBT, an LGBT 
parade with a big Bud Light logo and a truck, presumably perhaps a Ford, maybe, I don't know, but it has naked adults in front of children. And the tagline for that article says, Bud Light served as official sponsor at Toronto Pride Parade, where wild footage shows naked men marching and dancing in front of children and families along the parade route, unquote. And he actually got eight likes and 117 views. So pretty, pretty typical. Most responses are overall negative. And when I do see the positive ones, I can't help but see the parallels with the politics. And with the evidence we have right now, it seems like Bud Light is leaning into it. Again, they've sponsored parades for years, but the, the drag shows are a little bit, are a newer thing. And they're seem to be doubling down. Will this increase your sales? I mean, maybe by a half a percent point. Again, that's a growing community. So over the hundred year span, if the, if the growth rates are the same in terms of we seeing them doubling every generation, then Bud Light could, could become profitable. But I don't suspect they're prudent enough to have the long-term business vision and actually be having this be intentional, which is kind of proved by the fact that the marketing executives were put on an indefinite leave of absence and they've had to lay off so many people. So I can't help but think it was an attempt at a commercial. The attempt was made, but like most Bud Light initiatives, this eagle it had a broken wing and it uh, subsequently crashed, perhaps into a Philly cheesesteak. Other interesting cultural news, you have Disney set to invest $60 billion into theme parks and cruises over the next 10 years. Now, it looks like they said this in a regulatory filing last Tuesday that they were planning to nearly double their investment and they had spent during the last 10 year period on the same category of initiatives and products. Now, specifically, it would include parks, experiences, and products, including four Walt Disney theme parks, two at California's Disneyland Resort, and four additional theme parks in Europe and Asia. And they also noted that the Disney Cruise Line is also part of that division, which makes sense. You look at Disney and their movies these days, they lost near $2 billion in about the past, 10, uh, past year, which is one of the worst performances you could possibly imagine. It's almost as if someone from the US government who used to be in the budgeting department decided to join Disney and handle their finances. There's a lot of parallels. The US is now $33 trillion in debt, pathetically enough, with Democrats and Republicans just racking up that fee or that balance every single day. Now, they further went on to say that in addition to the development plans already underway, there's significant room for further expansion on land and sea, which, of course, the sea is not infinite, but darn near infinite compared to the land service area. Now, in all seriousness, they said that Disney theme parks have over a thousand acres of land for future development to expand the theme park space across its existing sites, the equivalent to about seven new Disneyland parks, which is astronomical. That is a lot of surface areas to cover. Now, in terms of an investment, when Disney keeps you know, losing money every single day on entertainment in terms of films and cartoons and Disney Plus, Disney Plus, their streaming platform, still not making a profit after all these years. They claim it's getting there slowly, but given the trends of Disney, again, they just canceled more than any other streaming company in terms of content. I can't help but think they're not going to get profitability on the Disney Plus platform, at least for eight fiscal quarters. It's... It's just not looking good for that part of the company. And if you look at where the company is making money, it's almost like looking under every nook and cranny, there is a part, there are places, oddly enough, where Disney is actually making a profit, as unbelievable as that sounds. And it is the theme parks, especially overseas, where I believe there's less of a boycott initiative, perhaps. And it's one of those issues where they're making all the money at the parks, all the profit is coming from there. Well, it makes sense. It's also, you know, kind of the, Inception of the company. It's one of the longest standing products and offerings for his end users. It makes sense that they're going to actually put some more investment into what's making them money and try to make the parks better. Now, let me know in the comments, do you think this is the right business decision or do you think they should take those funds and just roll the dice more into Disney Plus streaming, which at some point could become profitable. They certainly have a large collection. They have a lot of data. They have a lot of intellectual property to help bolster up the offering, but there's also a lot of competition. In terms of theme parks and amusement parks, the only competition really, realistically, I would say would be maybe, not really just Six Flags, which I would personally 
probably prefer just because they're a Texas-based company, but it's one of those things where they don't have all the fun little, you know, little creatures running around in those suits and all the knickknacks that you buy and all the Disney intellectual property. But in terms of apples to apples, that's as close as I can think of in terms of a similar experience. So, and even that's not a great direct comparison. The Disney theme parks are a much more different experience that you could kind of differentiate yourself from the competition as opposed to streaming where everyone has a streaming platform. Every TV show, every production company, everyone has a streaming platform. Most of them aren't even making money, which is another issue. Again, good luck with Hollywood Strike these days. <laughs> they want more, even though the companies are bleeding money and it's just, the streaming wars have just begun. It's going to get worse, mark my words. But let me know, do you think this is a prudent business decision? It'll be interesting to see. And of course, we'll find out if they're right eventually. Other interesting cultural news, you have Rachel Ziegler, the Snow White actress. Well, she's complaining that people are mean to her. And not surprisingly enough, she was roasted, or as the youth might say, ratioed on the Twitter sphere. Now, it looks like there's actually a little picture of her from a gentleman by the name of End Wokeness. And it was literally just her flipping off the camera. And oddly enough, the first picture says, again, this is the text before the actual picture is from, Mist, from Mr. End Wokeness. And it says, quote, the new Snow White might as well be the most insufferable woman I've ever seen, unquote. And it's hard to argue with that because it certainly seems true. Now, her first picture of her flipping off the camera is her wearing, what is this, a baggy sweater? Presumably she's not homeless, but she's, she's wearing like a man's sweater and she's flipping off the camera. And the caption that she put is respect women today and every day which again why would i respect someone who's starting the conversation by pejoratively flipping giving you the bird it's that, that's not really a sign of respect now i know there's no such thing as etiquette school these days which is something that i would argue every american actually should be sent to as opposed to public schools there actually used to be institutions where they teach you how to be a lady how times have fallen precipitously into the modern culture we have. Another picture of her is lying in bed, flipping off the camera. And she was, it, weirdly enough, so her eyes are closed, but her other arm is extended. So she's taking the picture. So she's taking a selfie, pretending to sleep, and flipping off the camera. No caption. But it, again, what... And maybe this is just one of those stupid trends, but I don't understand. Uh, that's not going to, no one's going to, why would people like you because of that? It's almost as if she's leaning into the meme. She's leaning into being insufferable. It's her thing now. She's embracing the insufferability. Now, the last picture of her, again, flipping off the camera, she's drinking from one of those mason jars with a handle attached to it. And now yeah, she's, again, just flipping off the camera. Now, this meme or this compilation of pictures from Andwokadis got 5.5 million views in about 10 days. So quite a few views are coming from this phenomenon that is Rachel Zegler. And again, she's the actress where she actually is pretending to be Snow White, which the whole premise of the movie has kind of gone to shit, so to say, because the movie, she said, oh yeah, the movie's not going to have a prince, which that was kind of important to the whole movie originally. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Oh yeah, they're actually, there's not going to be dwarves either. They're going to be a myriad of different people and sizes. So they're getting rid of that part of the film too. Oh yeah, and then I believe the evil person in the movie traditionally was the evil queen who was jealous of Snow White's good looks. Now, the evil queen looks infinitely more attractive than Snow White. So there's basically no parallels to the original piece of work and they just use the title hoping that foolish people will see the movie because of nostalgia and they don't do any research on the actual essence or actual body or content of the film. And again, she hates the original film. She's actually saying how bad it was in every, every interview you see with her. Now, again, no one has, I don't think many people have noticed because they don't produce anything great these days, but the Hollywood actors, actresses, and the writers, they've been on strike for months now. Now, one of the great things about that, well, there's many great things, but one of the best things is that you don't really hear from Rachel Zegler as much because they're not supposed to be in front of the cameras 
promoting the films because they want even more money than they're already making, presumably so they could buy their next house in Beverly Hills or their next, oh, what do rich people, what do foolish rich people buy? Their next Tesla and iPhone 12, or I guess not, as a joke, I, they're actually on the 15 now. They're all the same, slightly faster, slightly thinner. Great job, Apple, really innovative. But nevertheless, because of the strike, now she is, she's limited to the realm of Twitter. So a little bit of upside, you don't get to hear from her as much. And it'll be interesting to see if she learns any lessons, I doubt it, but she's perhaps maybe leaning into the meme of being insufferable. Now, going on to the political part of the podcast, you have Vivek, American Dream Story, going viral. Now, it looks like this was a compilation, a little interview from ABC News back in the day. And I think I think the message is resonating with a lot of folks. Now, it looks like specifically... Well, he was a... Gotta love when there's technical issues. Although if IT worked perfectly all the time, I wouldn't have a job. So, it's one of those things I can never complain too much about the situations. So if you go to actually the Twitter handle, what the hell? Excelled outside the classroom. Vivek sang opera as a child. And in high school, he was a nationally ranked tennis player. In addition to tennis, you're also, I don't know if we could call you a, a concert pianist, but-, but That'd be interesting. But, The valedictorian at his high school Tonight, let that journey begin Vivek went on to Harvard, majoring in biology Before also attending Yale Law School Where he met the love of his life Meeting Apoorva, she was already the person she is today Who pushes me to be the best version of myself At 29, he founded his first company, Royvik even delaying his honeymoon in order to ring the bell on the New York Stock Exchange. His goal was for it to help pharmaceutical companies develop drugs for diseases like Alzheimer's, a disease he first encountered as a child. I had a front row seat, for better or worse, to see it. Not just my grandmother, sister, and other family members, but even my mother, who treated these patients on the front line. That was her career. It became an important part of our upbringing, too, to be able to play the piano in those nursing homes. And in terms of the text before the video, Vivek said, quote, I'm not a politician. My parents came to this country 40 years ago with no money, and I've gone on to found multi-billion dollar companies. I did it while getting married to my wife, Apova, and raising our two sons. That's the American dream. For a long time, we've conservatives have been running from something. Now it's our mo moment to start running to something, to our vision and of of what it means to be an American, unquote. Which is very true. Republicans are very good at running away from a fight or even the semblance of having to fight. Can't help but notice every time there's a vote for something that would be nice, they, they never actually do anything. They usually just, there's a lot of, a lot of Republicans in name only, pejoratively known as rhinos. They much more, they're much more reactive. Now it's an old cliche to say Democrats are running off a cliff, Republicans are just walking there which is why I wish we had more of an independent choice. But another topic for another time, I think he does have a couple of good points about moving towards that and really highlighting how anyone can be successful. And the comments to this video, they're- well, He says education was always oh, geez, his parents. They are quite, pretty much overwhelmingly agreeing with him. The top comment is someone by the name of Great One. This person says, quote, Vivek Ramaswamy embodies the American dream. The valedictorian and nationally ranked tennis player earned success through tireless work and generative enterprises, yet his brilliance extends beyond business. He masterfully plays the piano and tried to kill, cure Alzheimer's. Vivek accomplished all this while raising a family. Unlike many elites, this renaissance man understands ordinary Americans' dreams and struggles. Ramaswamy run, ran towards his vision. Now he runs towards ours, an American renewal based on unity, creativity, and boundless opportunity to flourish. This visionary wizard has solutions no politician conceived. Vivek offers profoundly human leadership we need because he lives the ideals he represents. Unquote. And that person got 15.6 thousand views on the Twitter and 212 likes, which is the most likes of all the responses. And 
I think that is another good thing to highlight. A lot of folks in politics, and yes, Republicans too, they are the antithesis of what they stand for. They all say everything in front of the TV, or I guess in these, more accurately these days, in front of the webcam, and their actual personal life will not embody it at all. Which is why a lot of people were disgruntled with the, with the religious community for many years, because they noted that hypocrisy. And it seems, and again, if you have data that contra is contrary to that, with Vivek, let me know in the comments. I'll always research all of that, and I'd love to have more data, the better. But it seems like he's doing an ex exceptional job. And looking at the other comments, they're mostly, well, let's see here. You have one person saying, dude has it all, but why let him lead our country? Now, that person did get about 100 likes and 4,000 views. And what are the responses to that? Huh? Come on here, Twitter. Or X, as I guess they're calling it now. And someone says, compared to who? This sounds like nonsense. Someone else says, a con a, a con as contrary to who? Trump or Biden? Someone saying RFK is still 10 times better than Vivek. Which again, RFK is not going anywhere. And I don't say that to be pejorative or in any way. It's just the superdelegates won't allow it, which, yeah, it's one of those things where looking to how Democrats vote and how the operation works, Bernie Sanders should have got the nomination, but the superdelegates, the elites, would not let that happen. So again, I think that RFK has some great ideals, but again, I don't think the powers that be would let that happen. So. Looks like it went pretty viral. It got about 570,000 yeah, 570, views in 24 hours. And I think in terms of moves on the political chessboard, I think it'd be good to highlight that during his next campaign rally because that is something that really does resonate to the heart of the American dream and showing that you can achieve greatness. You just have to work like hell. And it really does, I believe, embody that just the vision for coming to America, working like hell, moving up the ladder and that entrepreneurial spirit as well. So I think his campaign really needs to keep that in the forefront as they're shaping their new strategy. And it may help him move ahead in the polls. And again, it's a long time away from the election, but who knows? Might help out a little bit, 1% of the polls, maybe. I know it's a lot collectively if you think about all the votes, but sometimes all it takes is a little bit to push you over the top. Now, granted, in this case, you need a lot because Trump is in the lead by every poll metric, basically. But maybe you just need to be number two and there's a lot of speculation, maybe it'll be VP. Another topic for another time, perhaps. Other interesting political news, you have the Chicago mayor wanting the government to run grocery stores. Oh, my joke about the Soviet Union and Illinois just slowly but surely becoming a reality. Now, it looks like the Chicago mayor is proposing the city owns grocery stores because stores like Walmart and Whole Foods are leaving, leaving a quote unquote food desert. Well, that's, that's weird. Why, why would a business leave Chicago? The mind merely boggles. I mean, I don't know. Oh yes, I, I, I can't help. Oh yeah, it's the unprecedented crime wave that never goes away. The culture of Chicago is rich, I'm told. Now, it is actually, fascinating enough, for the first time in decades, they actually voted out a Democrat, for another Democrat, but they like the definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Now, they ousted Lori Lightfoot, who was a human looking, a lot of people compared her to the Bass Pro Shop logo. She looked very similar to Beetlejuice, some might say. I would never make that comparison. Of course, I'd be disrespectful to her and her great accomplishments. What were they? Uh, she's probably racist, I remember that. She actually would not allow white people to interview her. Which again, you never had the reverse. You would actually be ousted, ousted from society, but only one or two news outlets actually picked up on that that little uh, policy of hers, which I found morally abhorrent and disgusting because everyone should have equal opportunity. That's just me. But apparently the Chicago the Chicagoans, they wanted someone else. So they voted in Mr. Mayor Brandon Johnson. And he's the one saying they need to open the grocery stores there. So this, the city should do it. Because historically speaking, the Chicago government, they're very effective, never at all corrupt, and they can get stuff get done. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, wow. Well, yeah. I can't say that with a straight face because, yeah, they are the antithesis of, I was about to say, the opposite of efficiencies. 
was going to say morality, perhaps is not a good word. They're, they've been corrupt for decades. But nevertheless, I'll get back to the substance. Now, it looks like Johnson announced last week that his administration would partner with a nonprofit advocacy group called Economic Security Project to put stores in underserved areas of the city, which Republicans are pejoratively calling Soviet-style central planning. Which, well, I would say people in the middle would probably recognize signs of the Soviet Union as well. But it's funny they're saying they're pejoratively calling it that. It's like, well, it is what it is. Now, it looks like Johnson announced it looks like four other Chicago warrants are still open, which is, the chain says in a statement, quote, continue to face the same business difficulties, but we think this decision gives us the best chance to keep, to help them open with the serving community. Which the chain says statement. Now, when the Post reached out to Walmart for comment, a company spokesperson pointed to this April sales, or the April press release, which said that, Collectively, our Chicago stores have never been profitable since we opened one 17 years ago, unquote. That is, that's how much crime there is in Chicago. That's how bad it is. They've been, they've had this store location for 17 years. And they never made a profit. But the culture of Chicago is great. Don't forget. And they're going to, just like the Chicago Bears, they'll be good next year. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big sports balls enthusiast, but even I know the Bears are rudimentary at best. I'm told they have a good defense. They just perhaps don't know what how to get on the scoreboard is their issue, perhaps. But needless to say, things are not getting better. Imagine being a business a business for 17 years and never made a profit. They're losing money. Yes, not a good idea to be there. They also said that last November, Whole Foods closed in Inglewood after six years in the South Side lot one year before their lease was up, which that shows how bad it is. In terms of retail, I mean, they're paying for that no matter what. So they actually left, they closed early. They left early because they're losing so much money. Now, apparently the location boasted very affordable prices for their infamously over, they're saying it's overpriced organic foods. Well, I would say that too, because you can get organic foods at Walmart too for a fraction of the price. But if it's, yeah, if it's affordable prices, that's, again, that's not the Whole Foods model. That's not going to be long-term profitable for them because the cost of goods for them are also more expensive than it, than average for a retailer or for a grocery store, rather. Now, they go on to say, however, as the years went on, items at the Englewood Whole Foods became too expensive for the neighborhood's residents, and the store was often empty at peak shopping times, like Saturdays, according to the outlet called The Block Chicago. And it looks like... Yep, the post coming to Whole Foods. Only time someone's saying we'll see if a government store actually goes there. Now it looks like there's a I they exist, I guess. The fact that they exist is interesting in and of itself, but there is a Chicago Republican Party. I know they probably only get 18 votes in the city of Chicago. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the demographics or look at the voting patterns in Illinois, like many states, the big, highly congested voting area where it's the bluest is the actual city. When you go to the outskirts, there are more conservative areas. You see this fascinating, well, not really, it's kind of a common phenomenon, actually, in other places like New York as well as California. But it looks like, in terms of asking for their comment, they said, quote, take all of the pri problems private chains face in low-income areas then add amateur management by bureaucracy, Chicago-style political corruption in hiring and contracting, and limited range of products, says, this is from Steve Bolton, the chairman of the Chicago Republican Party. Which, yeah, it's not going to work. And maybe one, one thing that the government of Chicago has done well in the past, like, 20 years? Yeah, it's not going to work. And they also continue to say, quote, Private chains should just pull out of all the neighborhoods because the city stores will have better police protection and lower prices subsidized by a long-suffering Chicago taxpayer. Yeah, good luck. Again, the businesses are leaving Chicago. Even Boeing left. That was one of the most prestigious businesses headquartered in Chicago. Now, in terms of you know Fortune 500 logos that the average consumer would know, McDonald's, oddly enough, is still headquartered in Chicago 
as dangerous as it is to be there. I don't just mean they're, you know, dangerous because being shot, but also because of taxes. It's going to be dangerous in terms of how can we get profit? I don't know. Now, it looks like Bolton also continued to say, quote, food deserts do exist in the Chicago neighborhoods, but the answer is promoting capitalist prosperity and stopping crime, not just injecting more socialist dependency, unquote, which, yes, I tend to agree. But it's also one of those things where you, need, you would need a cultural shift. If you really, and again, I've said this for years, and I'm not really unique in this statement. It's kind of a compilation of things I've heard from many people. And if you really want to turn Chicago around, which I suspect they don't, because like a lot of political issues, they want the issues to exist so they can vote, depend on you so you, they can actually raise money and get votes on those issues. And that's just, that's many issues to begin with. But as well as this is where if you want to fix Chicago, you just need to, well, you, you have to purge the city in terms of firing all the inept government employees that are there. You need new talent. You need to triple the police force, have them on the streets, damn near 24 seven on the South side, and then set up partnerships with schools and the communities. Get businesses to, once you get the city that's safe, businesses will come there. You have the businesses work with the schools, say, hey, if you complete high school, you have summer internships with us, we'll pay for your college. After you graduate college, you work for us for at least three years, so we get an ROI, and then you can go wherever you want. Again, make it safe, make it investable, and change the cultural shift. It could happen. Is it likely to happen? No, I don't think so, because in terms of my my beliefs in politicians doing the right thing and cultural change, I'm pessimistic to say the least, but that's my theory of how you could conceivably make it a better place for everyone, including from the people to the businesses. But I'm not sure if that's really what they want to do. Now, in terms of, you know, let's see here. In terms of the statistics on how bad it's getting, according to the Chicago Police Department, thefts are up 25% year to date and robberies are up 11%. Again, Businesses are leaving for a very specific reason. It's not safe and not profitable. You see the same exact thing happen in California, San Francisco. And yet it's hilarious. They still find a way to blame anyone else but themselves. Now, it looks like in terms of the commentary, it is pretty much agreeing with me for the most part. Yeah, so I'm saying, hmm, city-owned grocery stores, I've got to see this. Wonder if they'll be run as efficiently as a city-owned public housing. That's, that's a public sector burn. I appreciate that comment. Another one says, add a sign in front of each store saying, quote, allowed to take up to $1,500 worth of food before you have to pay. That should attract more customers, unquote. That person got 127 likes from that comment. And then the comment about the city on grocery stores got 192 likes. Then you have someone actually with some anecdotal experience from the city. Mr. T-Man 52 saying, quote, I grew up in Chicago in the 50s and 60s. One of the great aspects of Chicago life back then was simply the neighborhood. Every neighborhood had just about every business or service you needed to survive, and you could usually walk to them. Grocery store, hardware store, doctors, pharmacies, laundromats, hot dog joints, pizza parlors, etc. If my dad was at the bar and mom wanted him home, you only had to go to the corner bar to find him. But once they started looting and vandalizing businesses, they leave. Can't blame them. Unquote. Remember, this person got 32 likes. Which, again, is precisely the point. He is correct. Businesses are leaving. They have to. They, they're not, not every business is like Walmart and they can afford to have a loss for 17 years, which is fiscally irresponsible to say the least. It's almost as bad as the government. Well, not so much. I know the government's $33, $33 trillion in debt thanks to Democrats and Republicans. They also have another comment by James Pierce saying, quote, government owned stores. What a fantastic idea. I'm sure there's no chance at all they'll try to tell you what you can and can't buy and how much of it, unquote. The person got 46 likes, which is another very good observation. You have some government employees. Or what was that? In that? There's a former mayor, I think it was New York, where they actually banned, it was Mr. Bloomberg, they banned soda drinks over like 16 ounces because they want to be in control of everything, unfortunately. Now, let me know in the comments 
Do you think a Chicago government run grocery store would be successful? If you do, I'd love to hear your argument. Maybe some anecdotal evidence of when it's worked before and then take into account the culture of Chicago and then change my mind. I'd be fascinated to see what you have to say. Other interesting political news, you had DeSantis using a Daily Wire comment on Trump not, can't quite explain if a man could become a woman. Now, this is from the DeSantis War Room specifically, and it is interesting that the most viral things from the DeSantis War Room have no DeSantis in them. So this is just a clip from Matt Walsh, who some might know as the leader of the Sweet Baby Gang or the SBG. I can't explain what it is. I dare not. But many people do, and you know, warn your children, many people do know he is a gang leader of the SBG group. Now, this DeSantis War Room video they put it out one day ago got 640,000 views. When normally a video of DeSantis gets 40, 50,000. And every once in a while, I believe he peaked. There's, uh, two weeks ago, we covered a video on his response to the handling of how his state handled COVID. That got about 400,000 views, I believe. So again, if this isn't, a, if this is, isn't technically a personal best, it's up in one of the best. So I'll go ahead and we'll play the first clip with Matt Walsh. And then we'll actually play the real clip with Trump, where he's answering the question. And we'll let you decide, do you think this is being manipulative or do you think it's inaccurate coverage but without too much further ado we'll go to the DeSantis war room although right now it's just on the Twitter although I'm sure they have a physical room too. man become a woman question and there shouldn't be any answer other than no okay if you're saying anything other than no anything the first words out of your mouth after you hear can a man become a woman no then you can, you can elaborate on how crazy that idea is. First word should be no. Anything but an immediate no is a wrong answer and also an embarrassment. And if, if, if that doesn't, if you don't see why that is, then just imagine any other basic scientific question getting that kind of answer. So what if, you know, just to show you how ridiculous this is. Imagine if Megyn Kelly had for some reason asked, um, do you believe in gravity? Does gravity exist? And then Trump had said, um, <laughs> I, well, listen, in my opinion, uh, you know, there are some who say that human beings can fly, uh, but uh, I think probably not. What? What kind of answer is that? What, why, <laughs> in my opinion? But first of all, people are focusing on the um part of it. In my opinion, you don't need to qualify something like this by saying, in my, it's not your opinion, okay? Just like it. That reminds me of the office skit where they act like the Southern folks and then someone says, I do declare, which if you're saying something, you're already declaring it, you don't have to say it. It just, I guess, sounds fancy from a Southern perspective. It's, it's not, when I say gravity exists, that's not my opinion. So in my opinion, gravity exists. In my opinion, uh, the sun is bigger than the earth. It's not my opinion. That's just a fact. It's not an opinion at all. So. That was a weak and convoluted answer where clear and concise is needed and where there's simply no conceivable reason why you would give anything but a clear and concise reason uh, answer. Keep in mind what I'm always saying about this issue, that, that on the left, they can't answer these questions. So for them, that's a stumper. This is the beautiful thing about being a conservative is that basic common sense questions are not stumpers. We don't have to be worried about them. Someone could throw it at us and say, oh, that's easy. Yeah, two plus two equals four. No problem. It's only on the left where it becomes, oh my gosh, i got to figure out how to navigate around this. That's the advantage we're supposed to have because we're supposed to stand for basic fundamental truth. We are supposed, when we talk about being conservative, we are conserving basic fundamental truths. Or maybe not conserving the truths themselves because the, the truths will persist whether we, whatever we say about them. We are pursuing our, I mean, rather, we are conserving our understanding, society's understanding and acceptance uh, of these fundamental truths. So that's, that's an advantage we're supposed to have. But because the left can't answer these kinds of questions, um, or at least they can't answer in a way that's, uh, 
that is not humiliating for them. Because if they're asked the question, can a man become a woman, they also, they're probably not going to say yes. Some of them will. But if that was a Democrat politician sitting there, probably not going to say that because they know how crazy that sounds. So instead, they're going to start equivocating and they're going to be off in the weeds and they're going to talk about opinions and how everyone has different perspectives and uh, so on and so on and so, and so forth. When you, as the Republican frontrunner, give an answer that makes it sound like a complicated question, you are, that is just you, that, 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 that's you surrendering to the left on that issue. Because that's what the left wants. They want this to be a matter of opinion. They want it to be complicated. They want it to be the kind of question that you're nervous to answer. And it shouldn't be. Again, so that was, in terms of the text before the actual video that they reposted, the Defense Divorce Room said, quote, that's you surrendering to the left. Matt Walsh blog hammers Trump's weak answer on whether a man can become a woman. Anything but an immediate no is a wrong answer and also an embarrassment. And that got, in terms of statistics, looks like it got 655.9 thousand views in two days. Which again, for DeSantis' war room, is quite a lot. Now, in terms of the feedback, before we jump to the actual video with Trump and Megyn Kelly, you have some of the top responses. One being... Mr. Dr. Patrick M. AI changes everything. Quite a long name. This person says, and says, quote, Not if you look at what was implemented by the DOD. It can barely change... It barely changed... Oh, no, actually, there's a response. My apologies. So, Mr. Low Carb Studies said, quote, Trump literally banned trans from the military, unquote. That person got 24 likes and 1,620 views. Now, the response to that was Dr. Patrick M. AI changes everything. That person says, quote, not if you look at what was implemented by the DOD. It barely changed anything, nor slowed the process down. Trump tried to have it both ways, panders to the trans, then gaslights conservatives. That's the rhino way. Unquote. And this person also had a meme of Mickey Mouse holding a Bud Light with a rainbow flag on it. And it says Team Trump with a picture of Bruce, no. Jenner as a woman. I don't know. I forget the names. Uh, it said, despite Wednesday motion, Caitlin urged trans kids of America to stay hopeful. And that person got 40 likes. Another one said, o -M OG Mega Angie saying, he gave an immediate no, you lying corrupt clowns. First got 32 likes out of 1,156 views. And then another one responded saying South Dillon said, quote, if, if not, no, at least laughter at the absurdity of the question, unquote. That person got 296 likes and 7,356 views. OMG Angie saying, quote, he said, um, no, that's not an immediate no. Why DeSantis supporters sus sus insist on being such ridiculous liars is pretty funny though it shows what frauds you are like just like ron good luck with that winning strategy unquote though she said though tho which i found lazy but nevertheless that person did get eight likes for that response out of 388 views and someone else said mr calvin said quote trump going centrist wasn't on my 2023 bingo card person getting five likes and 436 views so it looks like uh, someone, Mr. Pedro L. Gonzalez, saying, quote, thank you, Matt Walsh blog. That person got 173 likes out of 5,199 views. Now, in terms of the substance, so that, that was the response. That was the analyst taking a look at the situation. Most people have no clue that in 2023, the best way to make you gotta be money. kidding me. Oh, good old ads. And on Amazon is not with physical products. It's Amazon's other Gabby. company, Audible. Audible paid what the? What on earth is going on with the computer here? It's me. Eight. Is this a new unskippable ad? Kill the volume first. Hmm. Can a man become a woman? Um. <laughs> in my opinion, you have a man, you have a woman. I, I, I think, I think part of it is birth. Can the man give birth? No, 
No, although they'll come up with some answer to that also. Someday, <laughs> I heard just the other day, they have a way that now the man can give birth. No, I would say uh, uh, I'll continue my stance on that. So that that was his response. Become a woman, man. Become a woman, man. Become a woman. Um, <laughs> in my opinion, you have a man, you have a woman. I, I, I think, I think part of it is birth. Can the man give birth? No, no. Although they'll come up with some answer to that also someday. <laughs> I heard just the other day, they have a way that now the man can give birth. No, I would say. Uh, uh, I'll continue my stance on that. Very interesting response. So, oh. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, got all technical difficulties left and right. So, he did have a long pregnant pause with that um. And, oddly enough, it was a very political answer. I don't think a lot of people were expecting that response from Trump. Most people expect his previous responses, which are much more off the cuff, much more bombastic in terms of right on the money, so to say. This is kind of like a cliche of politicians where it's very long, thought out, and you really had to search for an answer in that. And the comments, in terms of that was from a YouTube video, most of them are not so supportive. So, one of the top responses was Mr. Poor Entrepreneur 8276 said, quote, why don't people just straight up say no? And that person got seven, 29 likes. Now, interestingly enough, someone else said, quote, by the name of EAC, 3748, very inspiring name. This person said, quote, perfectly answered by President Trump. The reason they criticize his answer is because it's the truth. And this person got 19 likes. Interestingly enough, now someone else said, this person's by name, a real question, said, quote, his answer seemed pretty direct to me. Of course, there will be future efforts to obscure the differences between men and women further. It's a hot button political issue. So acknowledging that only makes sense. But he didn't say it had changed his own view or ever could. This person got 18 likes on the YouTube comment section. Someone, Mr. Another top response, Mr. Glandiro said, quote, love Trump from India, unquote. Got 15 likes. Another one by the name of Trish Sullivan said, quote, fumble, I must have missed it. Did you upload the correct video, unquote. That person got 15 likes. So it is fascinating. It's almost as if, depending on your political affiliation or kind of your current belief system, it just kind of reinforced your belief in them. So it seemed like, the people who already liked DeSantis, this proved their point. And the people who liked Trump, it can't prove their point. Which is another fascinating thing, very similar to the actual mugshot when he actually was arrested. You had Democrats who loved it, and they used it for campaigning, and Republicans who loved that very same picture for their campaigning. So, same situation, but two completely different universes, two completely different trains of thoughts, which is fascinating in and of itself. But let me in the comments, do you feel this is deceptive by the DeSantis campaign? Or do you think Matt Walsh and the DeSantis came, were they on the money with their assessment? This wouldn't be the first transgression if you're pessimistic against the DeSantis campaign. They used a deep fake using AI to actually have a picture with Donald Trump hugging Dr. Fauci. And in the picture, which is a compilation of six pictures, three of which were actually altered using deep fake AI, it actually said the real Trump. And they didn't have a disclaimer on that, which I don't believe that's very transparent at all. And I think DeSantis, he should have come out saying, I don't agree with that campaign strategy. This super PAC, or say it wasn't your call and actually address the issue and appropriately, it's a nice way of not punishing them in terms of verbally, you're not punishing them, but you're, you're letting them know it's not ethical, it's not moral. So you're disciplining them verbally would be a perhaps apt action. But they, he never did that. So there's some people who think that picture was real, even though a computer made it. So that doesn't seem very transparent to myself. Now, DeSantis, in terms of moving on the political chessboard, he's much more approaching, almost like a, a little bit more of a Chris Christie approach, where he's starting to lean in to the voters who are never Trumpers. In the beginning, DeSantis was very much more cordial with Trump, and 
it seems as time goes by, he's starting to lean in more and more to highlighting the differences, highlighting what he sees as the downfalls or the shortcomings of the Trump's campaign and presidency. So I think he could steal away those voters in the primary who are currently voting for Chris Christie, who has been the most vocal opponent of Trump for the nomination. But let me know in the comments, do you think this was one, ethical, and B, effective from the political campaign strategy? It'll be interesting to see, but there's so many polls I'm sure we shall see soon. Now going on to the business blunder of the day, you have Clorox suffering a cybersecurity attack, which might lead to a wipe shortage. Dear God, what will we do? Now, it looks like the parent company Procter & Gamble had a cybersecurity attack that forced it to take certain systems offline, which resulted in a reduced rate of operations starting August 14th. And apparently it's still ongoing with Clorox, according to a filing with the Security Exchange Commissions. Commission, rather. And it also said that it resulted in, quote, recently begun to experience an elevated level of consumer product availability issues, unquote. Which makes sense if you're under attack, especially because they are a manufacturer of household goods. If your fiscal machines are being attacked from a cybersecurity perspective, some of those technologies could actually just take them offline maliciously as well. So some of them, they have to micro-segment or just take off the network to be safe. Others may already be infected with malware or other malicious materials to actually take them offline or even more maliciously, perhaps change the ingredients and the actual substances and the percentage of the ingredients to make it a more volatile substance. So there are many examples of corporate espionage and they, I was gonna say the MGM being one grand being hacked, perhaps one of the most public facing large ones that people are aware of. Now, they continue to say the cyber attack damaged part of the company's IT infrastructure. They added that it was causing quote, wide scale disruption of its operations. And because of the delays and product outages, Clorox said it expects it will impact the quote, will be material on Q1 financial results. And of course they declined to say anything further. So definitely not good to have your machines, either they weren't protected, right? Of course, you know, this will be a long study. I'm sure it'll be a use case that kind of goes over the actual nuances of why the attack happened and what happened in terms of the order of operations that led to this. But again, in a time and age where everyone should know by now that everyone is a target from malicious actors, I mean, they're a large company. Procter & Gamble is one of the most premier businesses out there. They've been around forever. Famously headquartered over in Ohio, mostly known, I would say, for making the tie, little um, laundry detergent with Tide. And of course, they make many of the products as well. But to be around for so long, be such an established big company, and yet to have a cyber attack, take your operations offline so you can't produce a physical product, and this is going to have a direct physical result on the business, to not have a more bolstered security operations, that's, that's got to be the business wonder of the day. Thank you everyone again for taking the time to tune in. I know it's ambitious trying to get to 4,000 subscribers by the end of September. So if you could click that button, I'd greatly appreciate it. Also, don't forget to take the time to tell your families, tell your coworkers, tell your enemies. Heck, tell anyone and everyone. Just stay safe and fight the good fight.